Okay, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this session on um, digital trade and the environment um, organized by Tech UK. I am Sabina Chofu, Head of UN Trade Policy at Tech UK, uh, which is the business um, uh, trade association for tech companies in the United Kingdom. Delighted to be here today. Uh, to, to welcome you to this discussion, uh, whether you're joining us online or the five people in the room. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, today's panel will focus on um, trying to bridge the two parallel agendas in a way, um, which is the trade policy and digital trade policy specifically, um, and, and the climate and environment agenda and see where the links are there and what we can um, do to uh, converge uh, um, this to. Um, I think we've seen, and it's clear to everyone, and we've heard throughout the week, uh, a lot uh, less focus on the climate agenda because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, you know, that has been the case for a lot of the tech companies as well that had to deal with um, kind of the immediate aftermath of, um, of, of the pandemic. And uh, the climate agenda has, um, to a certain extent, fallen, um, fallen in focus. But we, we know that digitization is a powerful tool to, to achieve the climate objectives and keeping the, the priorities uh, right with, with COP26 coming down the line uh, in what, a month's time now um, uh, is and should remain uh, uh, an important uh, exercise. So um, today is an exercise in bringing together experts on a lot of different things. So, you know, data, trade, digitalization, environment, energy, and circular economy. So we'll hear from, uh, from a range of experts on the panel to see how the trade agenda and the environment agenda can, uh, can work together. So uh, on today's panel, we've got David uh, Jensen from um, the United Nations Environment Program, who's literally calling us from another building in Geneva. Uh, he's the coordinator for the digital Transformation Task Force at UNEP. Uh, we have Natasha McCarthy, who's head of data policy at the Royal Society in uh, London. We have uh, two people calling us very early in the morning where they are. Uh, George Kamiya, who's digital and energy analyst at the International Energy Agency, who's calling us from Vancouver. Uh, and Vera Johnson, who's the co-founder of Circular. Uh, it's a very exciting company and I can't wait for you to hear more about it uh, in a minute. And she is calling us at 6 a.m. over in California where she is. So, so welcome to all of you. As you see, lots of different areas uh, of expertise and lots to talk about in the next hour. Please use the platform to ask questions as you listen in to the speakers and I'll turn to them um, in the Q&A later on. Uh, and because there is so much to talk about, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop here and turn to David um, for, for my first question this uh, afternoon. Um, we, we know that digitalization can be a powerful tool for reducing the, the carbon footprint of companies uh, and system and advancing um, uh, climate action, uh, but how can digital trade uh, provision support effective climate action and smooth the path to the adoption of climate mitigating technologies? David, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Sabina, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. This is such a fascinating topic. I'll try to limit my remarks to sort of three key messages, and they'll partially answer your question and, and hopefully partially lay the foundation for more discussion. So, so I think the first key message is really, we need to start by understanding how the structural nature of the economy is changing, right? You have about 60% of GDP passing through digital channels by, by 2030. You've got about 4 billion people connecting through social media, 2 billion people playing online games, and 2 billion people consuming through e-commerce. So there's a fundamental structural shift going on, and this is leading to three major changes in the economy. The first is this massive connectivity and decentralization of the relationships between producers, their supply chains, consumers, governance, and finance, right? So our economic um, trans transactions, our social relationships, they're all being digitized at this planetary scale. And this is fundamentally leading to new incentives and new behavior. So that's point one we have to keep in, into account in terms of these shifts. The second big shift is the exponential increase in the amount of data that's being generated about our consumption behaviors, 
as well as our preferences and the supply chain of those products and services. So this exponential increase in data. And the third big shift is really the rise of platforms and algorithmic decision making. This, you know, platforms and, and platform actors are, are new in the economy um, with more power and influence than almost any other player. And they're actively influencing now our consumption choices. And let me just give you a couple statistics. If you look at some of the biggest platforms, you've got SAP, for example. SAP is claiming that about 76% of world uh, digital transaction revenue touches an SAP system. You've got Google uh, that has estimated, uh, oh, sorry, that has dominated the search engine market with an estimated market share of about 92%. You've got Amazon controlling 40% of US e-commerce, and you've got Facebook controlling around 71% of US social media sites. These four companies alone have a combined market capitalization of about 4.5 trillion, uh, which is more than the GDP of 100 different countries, right? So you've got massive increase in the power of these platforms. So those are kind of the main shifts taking place at the structural level in the economy. Now, my second core message is that these changes do offer massive opportunities um, and risks for environmental sustainability and climate action. So let's look at the positive side first. First and foremost, this, these changes offer really the potential for full supply chain transparency in terms of the environment and climate uh, performance of products and services. And this is really important for informing governments, informing consumers, and informing uh, finance. And this kind of information is a foundation, it's a, it's a core foundation for the circular economy. The second big uh, benefit is that we can begin to really understand how economic incentives drive specific behaviors, right? What are the incentives that are driving carbon intensive behaviors? And what are the incentives that are driving net low, uh, low carbon or net zero behaviors? The third is we can begin to develop feedback loops, right? Digital feedback loops and digital nudging um, that can help consumers cons uh, find products and services that are lower carbon and, and more performant. And in terms of some of the early kind of figures, like what are the impacts of, of those combined benefits? It's estimated that about uh, digital technologies and ICT can contribute about 20% uh, uh, of a reduction of global CO2 emissions by 2030 and that they may help to reduce about 10 times more emissions than they admit. Um, ICT can, can reduce the potential physical amount of natural resources and products by up to 90% through efficiency and, and through uh, substitution of, of atoms for bits. And they can help reduce waste and circularity by a factor of between uh, 10 to 100 times uh, through improved design and circularity. So the, the opportunities for digital transformation to, to accelerate environmental action, climate action, are incredible if they can be harnessed. Now on the, deck, on the negative side, as I'm sure other panelists will talk about, information communication technologies use around uh, 77, sorry, 7% 7 of electricity production and, and generate around 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they generate 53.6 metric tons of e-waste per year. Uh, they amplify misinformation and they actually can increase consumption through algorithmic influencing and persuasive technologies. So this basically means that the digital transformation can, or the risk is there, that it can amplify all the incentives and behaviors that are actually leading to the degradation of our planet and climate. So there's a risk side and there's an opportunity side. Now, final point is where are the major uh, policy uh, discussions and, and with respect to trade policy that we need to clarify in the coming year? I think there are five of them. First and foremost, looking at sort of regulations and standards uh, linked to environment and climate financial disclosures. This is already being discussed in the G20 with respect to the task force on, on climate related financial disclosures and the new task force on uh, nature related financial disclosures. We need company level standards, product level standards, um, we need uh, taxonomies and we need guidelines for, for digital data disclosures of that information. The second, again, looking at this question of standards, we need standards and enabling frameworks for calculating carbon footprints across supply chains. Look at, we have to look at how we calculate that at scope one, two, and three for both physical products and for digital products and services. And we must get to the point where we have global level quality, comparability, and interoperability of the way those are being calculated. The third is that we need to manage and disclose this information in ways that can actually inform what's called digital product passports, right? These are the kind of uh, information pods that every product or services in the digital economy will eventually have. 
We need to ensure this carbon information feeds those passports. Um, and we need to ensure all the other relevant information about its environmental performance uh, and life cycle also informs those passports. So we need standards around how do we create digital product passports and how those digital product passports um, embed themselves into, this, into a circular economy. The fourth public policy question is really looking at ways of nudging consumer behaviors towards lower, uh, lower carbon products and services. And how can platforms adopt kind of sustainability by default in their algorithms, right? And the final is again, looking at this question of, of platforms and their influence in, um, in, in sustainability, right? In climate action. So how can, we, how can platforms adopt standards, safeguards and transparency in terms of how they're, uh, how they're amplifying different uh, lower carbon behaviors and products and services? So those are some of the big uh, questions in my mind and some of the, and some of the very specific uh, trade policy items we should be debating today. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, David. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to to the whole idea of digital product passport and um, and the standards standards around it. And it is a, a big part of of trade policies, creating the standards, but also kind of that regulatory cooperation element of of, of trade agreements uh, that we are seeing increasingly popping up in modern trade agreements. Of you know, how do we how do we actually work together across the digital economy for um, creating those rules that actually work everywhere, as opposed to everyone going their own way <laughs> in their own little capital uh, when when the issues we face are so um, kind of global and cross cutting in nature. Um, you did mention the impact of the tech sector on the environment, and we'll come back on that uh, with George a little later on. Um, but I, uh, you also mentioned, you know, in your kind of opportunities uh, section. Um, uh, the whole value of data and and, and the insights that it can um, it, it can provide, uh, which you know is fundamental to to the digital product passport um, uh, um, uh, success in a way. So um, it's a good it's a good moment to 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 bring Natasha in. Um, in digital trade policy, we often talk about the importance of data flows, is the core policy aspect of, of, of any digital trade chapter um, and it's what you know business around uh, around the world is asking for to be able to, to kind of operate and scale up um, as well as the kind of downsides of, of data localization so you know it will be very interesting to kind of hear from Natasha on what are the links between you know these two big policy um, areas that we talk about in trade policy um, and the environmental agenda so Natasha over to you. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here today um, and it was really interesting to hear David's comments there and I might reiterate a couple of them and hope you bear with me while I do that but um, I'm here from the Royal Society which is the UK's National Academy of Sciences um, I work on our projects on data and digital technology policy and we're interested in thinking about the ways that data and digital tech can be used for the benefit of society and um, we've done some in-depth work with experts from across different disciplines into how data and digital technology can be used to help enable the net zero transition and address the current climate crisis. Um, so I'm not coming to this with a huge depth of expertise in, in digital trade policy per se, but what we'll talk about is some of the ways in which we need access to data to enable that use of digital tech for net zero, and how in some cases that might require movement of data across borders and how we could do that in a well-managed and a well-governed way. So, if I might just start off with some of the kind of areas where we do need better access to data or increased access to data. Uh, and again, as I say, this refers to work that's been done by the Royal Society, where we were able to bring together, say, climate scientists, along with technologists, along with social scientists, to get into these sort of deep questions about data flow. So one area is about improving climate science and in its efficacy and helping to guide industry decisions, policy decisions. Um, and so we need better insight into emissions. So I think there's a really strong case for being able to access detail and data on emissions at a global scale, but also to be able to get emissions data a much more kind of granular definition in terms of time and space to understand the impact and effectiveness of different climate interventions. So um, we're interested in, for example, bringing together data about sort of uh, emissions taken at the atmospheric level, alongside data taken at the more local level, looking at the kind of behavior of systems and the emissions from systems, so that we can have a much better and more detailed picture of global emissions. 
Um, and that's really important to be able to monitor those emissions. And as I say, create tools that can enable policy advise as policymakers to understand how emissions might vary across the year and how different interventions might affect them. And that, of course, includes uh, data about emissions from the tech sector. And we, there's various kind of estimations of those emissions. But what we absolutely need that data for is to ensure that any technological tools that are used to address climate change are not themselves particularly energy intensive, so that we can ensure that we're using energy proportional digital tools. So that's one kind of area of data, that kind of climate data that's important to industry policymakers and scientists. There's always also areas of data which are really important for giving better advice to consumers. And David talked a lot about this too in terms of understanding consumer behaviour. So that is data around the carbon footprint and the embedded carbon in the devices that we own, but also in the services we use, such as streaming services. And we're not meaning to say that there's a huge difference one can make by choosing to say stream Netflix at a, a different and a level of resolution, but taken together, there can be steps that individuals can take that can make a significant impact on emissions. So that kind of information that is trusted and available to consumers is really important in terms of understanding people's behaviors. And the kind of major vision of our work uh, is this idea of creating what we call a feedback loop or a control loop for the protection of the planet. So things like digital twins of uh, factories that enable uh, better um, management of factory production, enable efficiencies, digital twins of housing stock uh, that enable us to understand emissions from buildings. If they can be linked together, we can have a much better understanding of the kind of emissions created across different systems. And then we can understand how to manage that. Um, so there's two kinds of data we need to be able to do that to our best ability. Excuse me. The first thing is we need that emissions data. So we need to know what is happening across those different systems. But we also need data about the inner working of those sectors, from the mapping of physical assets to business processes. Because by that, we can use the data about emissions to create a feedback loop to improve those processes and to improve efficiencies. So that we've got this kind of idea of a connected uh, digital twin, a connected feedback loop for the protection of the planet. So that's all kind of why we need the data and why it might need to flow at an international level. There's various conditions that need to be met to be able to do this, and these are relevant both to um, data for net zero, but also for digital trade policy. And uh, David alluded to quite a few of these. Absolutely essential that we have standards and interoperability, so data is meaningful across sector and across nations. Um, that's absolutely critical. And those standards have to be for interoperability, but also for data quality. We need to know that we are getting accurate data, especially about emissions. And to that end, we have to have data that is auditable and explainable. We need to be able to interrogate and contest the data that we get about emissions. And we need to know that the systems that we're using to both generate data and to manage that data are secure and resilient, especially when we're thinking about digital trends. So uh, there's lots of kind of important um, conditions that need to be able to be met to be able to use data and technology for net zero. And these are likely to be important in, in trade policy more generally. Um, and in core to this is trust. So we think that the, any kind of use of data or digital technology for net zero has to be developed in a way that is uh, involving public engagement, involving engagement of people that use technologies that implement them, that is co-produced and co-designed. So all of these are really important to be able to use data for net zero. But I just want to sort of finish with a couple of caveats. That's all about enabling data flow and enabling access to data. But I think there are some cases where whilst it's valuable to make data about net zero open wherever possible, that's not going to be always possible because we're talking about data that might be commercially sensitive and that might be revealing of people's behaviours. So we need to think about the kinds of, say, legal institutions that can help uh, um, enable data to be shared in a trusted way, different things like data trust, data commons, thinking about how they can enable use of data. We're also really interested in how technology can play a role in the use of data itself. So thinking about how we might not necessarily need to move data from one place to another, but be able to analyze it where it sits using things like privacy enhancing technologies that can enable analysis of data while protecting it. That can enable us to draw insights, insights from data where it sits without necessarily bringing it together. So we need to think about this in the round to make sure that we are enabling the use of data for net zero, uh, letting it move when it's necessary to do so, but also thinking about ways to enable data use that can protect that data and ensure a trusted system. So thank you very much.
Sabina, if you're speaking, we can't hear you, or at least I can't hear you. George and Vera, are you hearing Sabina? Uh, no, I can't. Okay. As great as digital technology is, it has failed us. <laughs> Can you hear me now? So George, if you're on, why don't you go anyway? We hear you, yeah. Sabina. Okay, super. Sorry, sorry about that. It seems I have done something wrong as, uh, as ever. Don't tell anyone I work for a tech organization. Uh, so just to follow up from, um, from Natasha's points, uh, you know, on, on the feedback loop and how that flows really nicely from, from what David was saying, um, you know, how we need that to nudge consumers, but also in the same way to incentivize companies uh, as they look to, to decarbonize. Um, and, and the whole idea of trust when we talk about uh, data flows is absolutely essential to a lot of the work that we do in uh, in digital trade to actually um get to a point where where um you know we we kind of try to trust each other's systems to a to a good enough level to to allow for that to happen but also like your points around um you know we uh, we are not big fans of data localization in uh, in general but your um your concept about kind of treating data where it is and using it where it is but also of the data that can't be transferred um uh, and that you may still need to to use to to be able to kind of link it to, to the um sustainability agenda i thought that was really really interesting um, um addition to or brackets to uh, to the whole concept of, of, of data flows for for this um i promise to turn back to 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 kind of george now and to the, turn back to that concept of um you know what what about our own impact on the environment as a tech sector um and uh you know it wouldn't be a, a, co a complete conversation if we didn't didn't talk about that uh david did touch upon it um uh, but you know i i did want to kind of turn to you george to kind of go deeper into detail on first of all what's um you know what is the actual impact of the tech sector on the environment what are you seeing in terms of trends you know is it um is it increasing as an impact is it decreasing um and what is kind of the role of of, of of technology in decarbonizing other sectors of the economy uh, uh, as well as we as we talk about this so george good morning and over to you thanks sabina and, and thanks for the the kind invitation so um yeah i mean excellent points already raised by david and natasha so i'll, I'll try to, to to add to that but um so i i work for the international energy agency the iea um so we look at uh, energy and climate trends across the energy system so uh this is you know roughly three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions. So a, a sector we need to rapidly decarbonize. Uh, it covers industry, power, uh, transportation, buildings, oil and gas. Um, so all the, the dominant uh, sectors in terms of emissions. So when we look at the ICT sector, uh, so that includes everything from uh, data centers, data networks, uh, devices, uh, uh, the estimates we see are that uh, it accounts for about 700 million tons of CO2 uh, equivalent or about 1.5% of greenhouse gas emissions. So in other words, it's a, it's a fairly small share of global greenhouse gas emissions when we're looking at all these other sectors. So just for context, this is similar to, you know, an end use sector like chemicals or, or space cooling, uh, shipping, uh, or aviation. Uh, and it's on a much smaller scale than, a, you know, an aggregated sector like transport emissions, which is about 10 times higher. So um, and then if we're, if we're thinking about trends, so there are uh, several promising trends for this sector in terms of decarbonization. The first is that uh, when we look at the past decade, energy use and carbon emissions from the sector has been relatively flat. So this is despite global internet traffic going up by you know more than 15 times, uh, data center demand growing by more than seven or eight times. Uh, so this is a remarkable story of energy efficiency and unlike anything we've seen in any other sector. So, you know, when we think about fuel economy of vehicles that, that you know, it barely moves uh, maybe a percentage or two actually in the past few years has actually gotten worse uh, as cars have gotten larger. So in the ICT sector, the this, this trend where it's, you know, energy use and carbon emissions have been flat has been largely a story of energy efficiency improvements across these three areas. 
uh, as well as an increasing supply of low carbon electricity um, to, to power those uh, devices, those data centers, those networks. Um, and, and the other positive side of the story is that the, the sector has a lot of the solutions and, and resources to decarbonize faster than any other sector. So if we think about uh, ICT, a lot of it is, is, is highly electrified, which uh, means we don't have to look at fuel switching. It is a matter of decarbonizing the electricity supply. Uh, the other positive story is that uh, there's a very rapid capital stock turnover, unlike, the, for example, the power system, where if we build a coal-fired power plant today, that is likely to be in operation uh, decades from now, just because that, that is a, a long-lived asset. Whereas in, in the digital technology world, uh, that turnover happens a lot faster, which means we can deploy more rapidly, efficiently, uh, efficient technologies sooner, uh, we have software that is, you know, um, lives a matter of days uh, compared to decades that a lot of energy assets have. So, so these are, are, are very positive. The other, I guess, side of the story is that it is also uh, the demand is increasing very, very rapidly, uh, as other, others have mentioned. So, um, you know, for example, uh, internet traffic is going up 30 to 40 percent a year. Uh, so last year it went up 40 to 50 percent, um, largely because of the, the trends that we saw with COVID. Um, so we, you know, I, I mentioned we do have these uh, solutions to, to decarbonize. So the first big lever is energy efficiency, which has been a major story the past decade. Uh, so we'll have to continue to push on that. We'll have to continue to invest in uh, research and development of new technologies that are even more efficient. Uh, we'll have to have companies purchase and use more uh, low carbon, carbon free electricity. Uh, this includes the use of battery storage and hydrogen for backup power. Uh, for data centers, you know, we have digital tools as well to decarbonize. So, you know, uh, companies are using machine learning to reduce the, the cooling electricity use. Uh, we can fig use AI to, to figure out when, uh, you know, renewable electricity is going to be on the grid and, and start to shift different workloads across time and space uh, to minimize those carbon emissions. Um, and then the, the other side is we also need to think about uh, reducing the impacts of uh, uh, these products across their product life cycle. So not just the operational emissions and energy use, uh, which you know a lot of the, the discussion often centers around, but also the materials extraction, manufacturing, transportation, uh, and then end of life. Um, and then when we when we're th talking about that, you know, the, there's a very uh, there's a difference between if you think about the life cycle emissions from a smartphone, which are largely dominated, 80% of those uh, embodied carbon emissions come from manufacturing and materials, uh, whereas a, a highly utilized asset like a data center or data network, most of the energy use is going to come from operations. So we need to think about the the full life cycle of these products. Uh, and also not just looking at energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, but also the other environmental impacts that we see uh, from mineral resources extraction, water, uh, impacts on uh, e-waste, uh, and, and, and soil, uh, and, and others. So in terms of trade policy, so the, the, because ICT is so uh, electrified, uh, the majority of emissions from ICT are dictated by the electricity mix of where the you know, device or data center is located. So, um, you know, trade policy that uh, facilitates data flows that permits the building of data centers in regions with lots of renewable electricity, so we can keep that footprint down. Um, and then also think about trade policy that uh, facilitates uh, low carbon electricity trade. So, um, you know, there are regions with a lot of renewable electricity potential uh, or um, capacity already. Uh, how do we get that electricity to power those data centers? and or traded uh, and moved to the regions that are going to be using that electricity for, for digital technologies. Um, and then the, the final point I'd like to make is that, you know, this, this footprint, like I, you know, is, is, is manageable. We need to, to look at it and decrease it, but also we, we can't ignore the kind of outsized impact that uh, it has on other sectors. So as David mentioned, there's a lot of uh, enabling potential to reduce emissions. There's also risks of increasing emissions in other sectors. So if we think about um, digital technology applications like e-commerce um, or teleworking, the, the real world impacts on emissions are going to be much, much higher from uh, transportation and uh, buildings. So teleworking, for example, the, the reduced emissions from commuting is, is much greater than the emissions that 
you know, are going to be used to uh, facilitate a Zoom call or, or the, the power of the laptop that you're using. Similarly, e-commerce, there are, you know, as David mentioned, algorithms to encourage uh, more consumption um, or rebound effects that uh, encourage more consumption. And then that has ripple effects throughout uh, the transportation uh, and, and supply chain. So we need, we need trade policy to, to look at all these aspects, not just the direct footprint, but also these uh, kind of uh, indirect uh, effects as well. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, George. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's great to hear that technology does offer the solutions um, to, to also uh, decarbonize and help other sectors kind of move into uh, a carbon neutral um, uh, status. Um, you did mention a lot of the opportunities. Uh, you also mentioned some of the challenges. And, you know, this is a, a great time to, to kind of bring Vera in um, because. Um, when you when you touched upon uh, e-waste, uh, that is something that not only um, uh, the tech sector but a lot of a lot of manufacturing sectors are still struggling with, which is you know the design, reuse, um, remanufacture, and recycling of products at the end of life. Uh, that is still is still a big challenge, and that is an area where trade policy can and should play a, a bigger role. So um, maybe it's a great time to to turn to Vera and um, uh, yeah. Yeah, please do tell us more about Circular, first of all, because that is a very exciting company. Um, and then, um, you know, if you can link um, uh, that to, to the trade agenda, that'd be great. So, Vera, over to you. Thank you. And um, thank you, David, Natasha and George. I feel like I've been set up for this conversation because um, I come at this from the point of view of being that climate tech company that is collecting that data. But the biggest challenge we have are about policy, um, trade, um, conversations which enables that transparency to be used properly. So let me start off from the basic premise. Tra traceability starts from the point of view of digitizing supply chains. And by doing that, collecting the data all the way from source, as the material changes physical state, so David, you mentioned about digital twin, Natasha, you talked about some of the carbonization elements that go into that, and George, you talked about you know, what, what is the impact of that. We're collecting huge amounts of that data, all the way from source, as the material changes state, all the way through to end product. And that's across the entire supply chain globally. That creates a huge swathe of issues from a trade policy perspective. Digitizing that supply chain means we're also collecting the scope one direct emissions, the scope two bought in, and the scope three inherited, but as part of individual supply chains. So that creates the first piece, which is traceability, which throws up a whole set of questions. Then the second step is how do you create a circular economy from that as those materials either get um, extracted back, reused for second use in terms of physical state, and then recycled into a future economy which is also about future economic cycles, the economy of materials into a different life cycle, and therefore the different value pricing that we attach to that. Some of the things that we're seeing across the EU, particularly who I think genuinely are in the lead, UK and EU, US have on very quickly, is about product passports. Having created that first piece of traceability, and then as we move into a circular economy to reduce carbon emissions, what can the future product passports offer to us as economies as we start to trade globally, particularly in that reuse, recycle and reform conversations? You know, what role does the government have in this? What role does um, influencers have in this? So if we're going to genuinely scale to a, a circular economy via trade policy, then we need to think about a number of specific things. Extended peer responsibility, particularly in terms of first use and then second use. And as a platform player, the challenges that we're seeing with our clients is a number of specific issues around data sovereignty, data use and data sharing the source and origin of materials. So trade tariffs have a huge part to play in encouraging cross-border trade. 
at the moment, we don't actually have a common standard. And Natasha, I think you alluded to this, is we don't have common standards to enable the companies who do this properly to be supported because the definitions and the way in which source of origin is defined does not help trade border policies. Carbon offset and carbon offset mechanisms, again, are not standardized. So what I foresee is, and again, this is based on genuine conversations we have with clients, is companies wanting to move their production and manufacturing facilities to locations where there is less definition about what a carbon offset mechanism looks like and the adjustment of that. So that globally, there needs to be much more commonality and understanding of the price of carbon because we need to start treating carbon as a commodity. And therefore, the more commonality we have about that definition and the way in which that is normalized across regional boundaries, national boundaries, and international boundaries will make a huge difference. We talk a lot about the emissions trading systems. In the production of materials in the first place, there is a huge amount of emission, but less so than when we get into recycling economies. First extraction, very straightforward. We extract, we make, we use, we throw away. But as we go into the circular economy, we need to find a different narrative as we get into how we deal with emissions trading systems, as we get into a, 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 a genuine recycling, reuse economy, a genuine circular economy, because the price of reuse materials is actually higher. And therefore, from a trade perspective, we just need to make sure that as we go back into those materials being re-entered into the systems, especially as consumers, that we should be willing to pay a little bit more to support companies who do this properly. And my, my, I guess my final point is um, particularly around um, standards and coordination. We have a lot of countries, and especially as we're coming up to COP26 and the G7, we just need to understand how is it that we get the G7, the COP26 narrative to be much more about recycling, reuse, and adjusting some of these me mechanisms to make sure that we support companies. There are so many amazing examples of companies who are doing this properly, but they're not supported. So I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thank you so much, Vera. And um, I can see a, a big hand up from David who wants to, to react uh, to, to what you've just said. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe just the question for me and it comes back to you, uh, Vera, and I'll, I'll turn to David also in a minute. Is there any, you know, obviously you're, you're operating kind of in, in, in a lot of different markets now. Are there success stories? Are there, you know, either countries or regions? You know, you've mentioned the EU and the UK when it comes to kind of the, the, the passports. I'm wondering, you know, in terms of getting the, the narrative, the policy narrative right, um, are there success stories, places to look at for, um, for how to do this right that, you know, can inspire the rest of us trying to figure it out among uh, the various different countries in, in, in the WTO and in bilateral agreements. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe just that, and then I'll turn to David, if that's okay. There. Sure, thank you. So I'll, I'll point to a couple of examples. So one of our OEM clients wanted to be able to show that, and I'll use batteries as an example, because it's very topical, and it's there now, they wanted to be able to prove that at least a minimum of 20% of the cobalt used in their batteries is from recycled cobalt through applying my first principles of traceability and understanding where materials came from and showing the track of journey, we were able to prove that the entire battery pack that they were getting was 100% virgin cobalt. What that allowed us to be able to demonstrate was that the narrative wasn't about where the original material came from, was that our recycling economy and our recycling um, principles have not yet caught up with what we're all trying to achieve globally. And therefore the investments, the, the way in which we're looking at the circular economy needs to change properly in terms of incentives. The other example I will use is um, 
and this is the, a very funny story, um, cow to hide to car. We're absolutely able to prove where the cow came from, which field it was um, nurtured, what happened to it when it came to an abattoir, and which car seat, which airplane seat it went into. So we can actually track everything all the way back, but the, the world narrative hasn't yet caught up with what do we do with that information? How do we want to change it? So as a, tech, a climate tech company, we're providing that data, but there's nobody really supporting us properly or our clients who are pioneers doing this. That is, that is a, um, a very good point and a, and a wake up call, I guess, on, uh, you know, um, sure, the technology companies that exist and provide that traceability and the, the, the quality of data that Natasha was talking about earlier. You know, we, we kind of get to a stage where we have all of it, but we need to change the narrative of what we do with all of it. So um, th thanks a lot. Great point. Uh, I will turn to David now because he's been patiently waiting for past five minutes. David, over to you. Thank you so much. I, I loved all of those interventions. I was furiously taking notes. I wanted to pick up on, on one kind of point that was missing from, the, from all of our presentations, and that's this whole question of the digital divide. You know, half the planet remains disconnected uh, right now. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to connect half the planet, and that is going to have a massive ICT and energy footprint. So I think George pointed this out. The material footprint for digitizing the world and for moving in this direction is, is huge, but so is the need to uh, achieve a green energy uh, infrastructure, right? We need, to, we need to move towards green energy. And if you look at the latest World Bank report on, on this question about material and mineral supplies needed to underpin a green energy transition, we're looking at an increase in demand uh, for, the key, you know, for the key material inputs by around 500%, right? by 2050, which is absolutely huge, which means in order to achieve that, we have to create that circular economy, right? We have to start capturing that e-waste uh, at a full, fully percent. Right now we're capturing, recycling about 17% of global e-waste. So we need, to, we need to bring that up to hundred and we need to do that obviously through a circular economy mechanism. So I think circular economy is, is, is kind of one of those existential needs, right? If we're going to, actually digitize the planet, move towards renewable energy and green energy, that's gotta be that, that basic underpinning of our strategy going forward. Thanks, and that's, uh, you know, kind of bringing in the, the, the digital divide conversation is, is in literally every policy area you can think of is, um, is the kind of fundamental question of how do we actually get to a point where you kind of have all the data, but also have, um, uh, the companies that have the opportunity to innovate in that space in a lot more different markets than we currently do. So, um, uh, Vera, you wanted to come in here. I saw you off mute for a second. Um, yes, absolutely. So I, I think, David, you're absolutely right. One of the things that we're finding, and I, again, I will talk from this from a very practical, doing it real time, doing it right now conversation, is that there are, there are huge um, numbers of the globe that do not have that digital capability. And they don't have the ICT infrastructure to do this. So what we're trying to do is change the dynamic, the commercial dynamic to support them to make this happen. And the, the more that we can talk about this, the more that the Western nations, particularly Western nations can support the, I guess the drive for investment into um, infrastructure. And I would call it critical infrastructure now to be able to do that, I think is important because those nations that don't have that ICT, that digital capability, are the ones that have the world's resources that we are currently depleting. And therefore we, we also have to think about the social responsibility as Western nations that we have to make that happen. And equally as companies that are involved in their supply chains, there is an amazing social and economic and environmental footprint that we need to get involved in. Thanks, Vera. Uh, absolutely fantastic points. And maybe I do want to bring uh, Natasha in on this uh, on this uh, question of, of the digital divide, because obviously a lot of the things you touched upon related to quality of data and the various innovations that are happening in policy as well to allow to, for the access to data and the traceability. Uh, you know, obviously that's a conversation. That's a that's a bit of a, um, a conversation that that we are having in the in in from the luxury of the developed world and and um, um, where you know our companies are 
innovating massively in this field. Uh, but there is a question about, um, you know, how do we actually broaden that conversation, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, when you don't have access at all to data, how do you talk about quality of data? How do you talk about, um, you know, the, the, the important bits of the puzzle that, that sometimes are, are missing? So uh, I don't know if you wanted to, to jump in on this question. I think this is a highly important point, actually, and I think that just a couple of things that I draw out from that. There's the point about access to data and digital systems is also the point about digital skills and uh, being able to use data for net zero in particular shows the need for digital skills across all sorts of sectors. And we, for example, highlight agriculture and land management areas that are not naturally digitalized. So there's a big question there about how um, people are empowered and have the capability to be able to use data in, a, in an important, in a sort of effective way to be able to do what they need to do to, to run their businesses, but also to reduce emissions. I also think though that there's a really important um, uh, need here too when we are trying to think about how uh, the digital divide can be addressed and build capacity, how we do that in a, a really co-productive kind of way, a participatory way. I think to me that's a really important um, lesson. How do we build systems that really work for users? How do we involve people in those conversations rather than sort of taking a solution that works one place and importing it somewhere else? So I think that you know addressing the digital divide, we need to do that way in a really participatory way. Uh, as we do across all uses of data for net zero. So those are the kind of points I would raise on that topic. Thanks so much, Natasha. Um, brilliant points on the participatory nation of it. I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, us in trade policy also need to kind of broaden that conversation. It's a bit of an, a, a difficult um, exercise when uh, when you're trying to translate very technical kind of trade agreements and trade provisions into what it actually means on the ground, um, you know, not only for consumers of, all over the planet, but uh, but for small and medium-sized enterprises as well, on one hand. And on the other hand, how do we take more of that input from, from companies into, into trade policy? And, you know, in this conversation that we are having with Vera now of like, you know, these are the actual policy issues that we are facing, these are the, 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 the access issues that we are facing and how we can, you know, kind of, what are the policy solutions to those? Um, Vera, I see you're off mute again, so pass over back to you. So, so one of the things I'm seeing, and I, I guess I'm, I'm in a very, very fortunate position, having come from the UK and the European environment and trying to launch in the US, is this whole issue of source of origin as part of border tariffs, particularly in terms of product tariffs. Being able to prove where material comes from, and where it's substantially made, I think will have a huge impact on um, the leakage of tariffs in the economy, particularly across borders internationally. So anything that governments can do around that, that would make a huge amount of difference around not, not a, I guess, not allowing companies to take the easy option to just relocate the companies, but actually deal with source of origin properly. Thanks so much, Vera. So many issues. I, I, I have a I have a long list now of uh, of homework and things to pick up and and continue the conversation on. I see David has his hand up, but I, I wanted to kind of raise one point, maybe with with uh, with all of you in a way, um, and that is the whole conversation around innovation in trade agreements. So what we are seeing um, in in trade policy recently, in digital trade policy in particular, is that it broadens up this uh, this you know what used to be a question of data flows to um, more regulatory cooperation around standards and the issues of all mentioned, but also cooperation around innovation, kind of. Um, um, putting, you know, putting this commitment at the forefront of, of digital trade, which is that, you know, we'll kind of ask our regulators and policymakers to talk to each other as we develop our innovation strategies and innovation policies. And I guess, um, you know, one of the conversations that's maybe not happening enough there is that around sustainability and environment. So, you know, I'm, um, you know, maybe one one for George as well, as we, as you were, you were touching upon um, the kind of, you know, direction of travel as we move from here, um, you know, how, how, um, um, important is that cooperation when it comes to, to kind of regulation and standards, but also like this future looking um, uh, innovation discussion. Um, I'll maybe turn to David first and then to George. Well, I want to just raise that we keep flirting with an issue that I just wanted to raise again, and that's the question of who pays for digital public good data and what are the business models that we can get in place 
so that digital public good data can actually flow uh, from all stakeholders who have it into some kind of common repository, some kind of digital ecosystem for the planet. So at, at the moment, uh, we don't have good business models in place to actually pay for public good data. It's sort of the donor, the donor model, but that's not that's that's very uh, episodic. It's not reliable, uh, just in terms of cash flow, and it's not covering all the data, the high value data sets that, that companies need. So I think we also need a conversation about what are the high value data sets that companies need to drive forward their net zero ambitions, and how do we create business models that that offer the funding from the private sector to the public sector to pay for those digital public goods. Uh, thanks, David. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, key point to to raise in this conversation. Um, George, I don't know if you wanted to to briefly comment on this. Sure. Yeah. So on the innovation angle. So if we if we think about the energy system, um, you know, when we look out to twenty fifty to twenty seventy, a lot of the emission reductions that we we see in that kind of time frame uh, are going to be coming from technologies that aren't yet commercialized today. So they are in prototype or maybe they don't even exist yet uh, or they're being um, uh, developed. So really early stages. Think about, you know, especially about hard, hard to abate sectors like aviation or, or shipping, uh, heavy industry, steel, cement. Uh, these are sectors where innovation is absolutely critical for us to get to, to, to net zero emissions. Without that innovation, we are going to fall well short of, of those emission goals. Um, and, and in the ICT sector as well. So, you know, we have uh, technologies that are improving uh, efficiency every year. Um, but like I said, the demand for these services is just growing so quickly that uh, within a, a few years, we could, um, we, we will need new technologies that are uh, vastly more efficient than the technologies today to keep pace with this, this growing demand. So yeah, absolutely. Innovation is critical. And we are going to need to uh, be able to de deploy the, the the technologies that are developed, at least for the energy system, across all countries, um, uh, where you know learnings are are, are being uh, made in, in different places. So, uh, yeah, absolutely critical. Thanks so much, George. Um, just aware of time, and you know, I want to kind of uh, kind of bring this panel to to a close yeah. with with a bit of an exercise. So, um, you know, let's all assume that you are trade negotiators for the day and you are negotiating the future WTO plurilateral on, on trade and the environment. Um, what is one action that you would advocate for that you would think would make the biggest, the fastest uh, difference in, in, in trade policy to, to kind of align it with the environmental and sustainability agenda? and uh, maybe start with David. That's easy. Um, I don't know if this is accurate, but I know what I, I think it should be, and that is creating some kind of API for Earth framework. Um, so application programming interface family around environment and climate data that, it, that is a global standard that allows aggregation, that allows quality control, that allows a trust framework. We need that kind of API ecosystem so this data can flow from the actors that have it in a standardized way, quality controlled way, trustful way, uh, so it can flow in and, as I said before, then be used to actually influence decisions in the real economy. So it, we need sort of that input and then that output. And ultimately, the API framework um, has to facilitate uh, has to facilitate economic actors to get access to the data they want. And I think the other thing that just in terms of you asked a question about um, what can we learn, I do think the way that the internet itself was set up, and I think some of the internet governance forum and some of the different ways that internet standards have been developed between public and private actors is probably a good model that we need to be looking at. So I think there's lessons to learn from uh, the internet community and you know how we could apply some of those lessons to some of these issues we talked about today. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, maybe go to Vera next. What will sort out all your problems? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> where do I start? I'll just go for one, actually. The, um, the, I think the single biggest thing that will help drive our economies towards net zero, genuine net zero, is product passports. You know, we all have passports. We travel. We know where we come from. We know the genomes of our parents, our grandparents, so on. Why can't we have a product passport with a set of characteristics that define what minimum net zero looks like? 
Thanks, Vera. Uh, I think that echoes a lot of, of, of this hours long conversation. So uh, noted. Um, George. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that notion. Um, you know, if, if we think about consumers, the, you know, a large segment of the, the emissions and energy use uh, from ICT come from devices, from end use devices, and the bulk of those energy use and emissions do come uh, from the supply chain. So understanding uh, the sourcing of all those products and the embodied emissions would be absolutely critical. The other challenge I see for the ICT sector generally in terms of the direct footprint is that there is a complete lack of uh, credible data uh, out there. So, you know, these these numbers that uh, we've, we've seen um, are basically modeled estimates. So there is very little done systematically at the country level or regional level to collect the energy use of uh, data centers or, or networks or devices. Um, so there is a huge gap in terms of understanding uh, both the direct energy use as well as the, the supply chain emissions from all of these technologies. Uh, and then the methodologies to account for the indirect effects across the, the, the other sectors is, is also something where we need to make much more progress on. So uh, just, yeah, a, a lot more progress needed on the, the data side as well uh, and collecting that data. Yes, uh, thanks. I mean, you know, it, it did come back quite a lot. You know, Natasha started it with the quality of data at the, at the beginning of this hour. Um, and, and, and then there's also that element that Vera was talking about, which is, okay, even where we do have the quality data, if we ended up at the end of the process, what we do with it? And that's where, you know, the kind of the role of, of, of policy in a way comes in. Uh, Natasha, for uh, the closing solution. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to carry on on the theme of data. And I think a way of framing this is having at, at the forefront this idea of data as critical infrastructure. So data as essential infrastructure to meet net zero. And that includes you know, the data itself, uh, the, the cleaning of it, the, the management of it, but also the institutions that enable its use, that enable its uh, sharing where appropriate. Uh, and all of these sort of systems that enable the uh, receiving of that data so the point was made about what do we do with this data uh, when we get it and I think this really chimes with David's point which I, I really want to back up that, that if you have good infrastructure it's good when you keep it well maintained when you manage it and that costs a lot of money that needs investment so managing critical infrastructure needs investment so that data infrastructure is something that does need to be funded so I think that'd be the thing to have in front of my mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I see agreement uh, across the panel on that point. Um, thanks a lot to all of you uh, and, and to our audience uh, today. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a great conversation. It is a nascent area to look at, um, uh, as we've seen, but kind of bringing, bringing uh, people together with kind of different expertise linking into this um, uh, kind of climate conversation.